and welcome to the Indiana State Police Public Information Program. I'm your host, Sergeant Dave Burston, Public Information Officer for the Indiana State Police at the Indianapolis Post. Today we have a very special program for you. We're going to be talking about Operation Lifesaver. That's a national program that helps promote railway safety across our nation. And we're bringing it to you directly from the railways of Indiana as we are here on a Conrail train. Stay tuned with us as we talk to a number of people about railway safety. We'll be right back. Watch these messages first. You are 100% unadulterated energy. You have no choice but movement. You aren't acted on. You are action. You have the power to make the world a better place. You already know how to do it. Volunteer now for the American Red Cross. Call your local chapter for details. You don't need algebra, geometry, and calculus to get this job. Now, if that doesn't convince you to take math courses, I don't know what will. Call NACME. We'll tell you what you need to do. That was your driver's license. Your car and your cash. Your best friend. Your freedom. Oh, and then there's you. Wear a safety belt and don't drink and drive. The police will nail you and get in busted bites. Hold on to dear life. We were on vacation at Lake Tahoe. And every precious smile. I was driving home and I fell asleep. I remember just wondering when we were going to stop rolling. When we finally did, I said, where's, where's McKay? And my husband said, he's in his car seat. He was safe. Hold on to dear love. Chuck, how long have you been uh, with the railroad? I've been with the government for 25 years. And could you tell us a little bit about your position? My position is a safety inspector, uh, railroad safety inspector, and my, pro my expertise is uh, operating practices slash hazardous materials. Uh, in our office we have uh, track inspectors, motor power equipment inspectors, operating practices inspectors, and hazardous material inspectors. Chuck, you play a, a big part with Operation Lifesaver, is that correct? Yes, we do. All the inspectors in our office do. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the issues you like to uh, to educate the public about? Well, one of the main issues is that they must remember the train cannot come and get them. They've got to come and get the train. When they're at a crossing, and in every book that we publish for road safety, it states stop, look, and listen. And if we could get people to do that, we would have no problems. However, people forget that engineer sitting over there has no steering wheel. He cannot come after them. They've got to get in front of him. Uh, we hear the news all the time about a uh, train hits vehicle. In most cases, the train did not hit the vehicle. The vehicle hit the train. The only way the train hits a vehicle is when he gets in front of our locomotive. Other than that, he can't hit them. And even again, if, it, if the car is in front of the locomotive, it's because that car is in a place it should not be. Exactly. He's either run around the gates or he's disregarded the crossing. He's trying to beat the train. And this is where we end up with our fatalities. Now, have you actually witnessed a collision yourself? No, no. Uh, that's fortunate to be able to say that. Yes, I'm very fortunate, no. I investigate them, but I, don't, I haven't witnessed any of them. Now, when you conduct these investigations, uh, out of the number of crashes you've investigated, 
what would you say are the number where people actually survive versus where people are actually killed? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a rea uh, rarity when they survive a train car automobile accident, simply because of the difference in volume. This locomotive is the same principle as you running over a pop can with your automobile. When he hits a, a motor vehicle, he, he, sometimes he doesn't even know it until he sees the debris flying, then he realizes he struck something. Now, in those times where you've been able to speak to survivors that were in a car or to witnesses, what do they usually say? Do they, do they, do they never even look at the crossing, or did they just misjudge the speed of the train and thought they could beat it? Well, I discussed this with a, straight, a state trooper one time, and he told me he was sitting at the crossing, and this young lady pulled up with three children, or two children in the car, looked directly at his patrol car, and then pulled right in front of the train. Goodness. And he had no idea why, and he could not, even when he talked to her later, uh, her, as sad as it was, her two children were killed. Uh, Chuck, tell us some of the other concerns that you have with our Operation Lifesaver and also in your position as an inspector. Well, I think it would mainly be that uh, if we can get out and educate more and more people, uh, you know, if we save one life, that's all that really counts. Uh, it makes my job easier and it makes your job easier. Uh, and it makes his a lot more pleasant because he's the one that actually suffers when he hits a vehicle. Uh, as I said before, the last thing he sees when he hits a vehicle is those two eyes looking up at him and there's absolutely nothing he can do. Uh, In talking about there's, there's nothing that he can do, explain to the people that are, that are watching this program, how long does it take a locomotive like this to stop once the brakes are applied? Well, that depends on his speed, but I'll give you an example of an accident I investigated out in New Jersey. Uh, the locomotive, which was a GG1, the old Pennsylvania's GG1, uh, was traveling at 60 mile an hour and hit a 35 ton tamper on his track and took it 2,800 feet down the track before he stopped. So that gives you an idea. So it it will over at a, a freight train with uh, 100 cars, it would take him a good mile to stop at 50 miles an hour. Someone once said, we all come into this world alone and we leave the same way. But in between, we have the chance to connect and help each other, to find ways you can do something to connect with the people in your community called the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. difference is one drop of paint going to make. This much fertilizer isn't going to pollute anything. You're looking at a sea of excuses, created drop by drop by people like you and me. Our waters can be saved if each of us does their part. Drop by drop. If we all do a little, we can do a lot. Brought to you by the Natural Resources Defense Council, the EPA, and the Ad Councils of the U.S. and Japan. A 38-year-old single mother, working two jobs, so she can raise her kids in a decent neighborhood. A 26-year-old drug dealer. A new neighbor looking for new customers. At stake, her children. Whose side are you on? You can help the community organizations that can help her. Call us. We're fighting for the children. Whose side are you on? Sarah is a lot like you and me. She loves pepperoni pizza and spy novels. She likes her work. She doesn't drink or do drugs. And one day, just like you and me, she was in a hurry. So she ignored the speed limit and drove too fast. 
Speeding gets you nowhere. Fast. Now, Tom, tell us from, from your perspective as an engineer, what are some of your concerns when you're, when you're actively engineering a train and you're coming up on crossings and some of the things you've seen over your 25-plus your year career? Well, I mean, it's just always the, you know, the cars, are, they want to challenge you. And uh, the other thing would be uh, people throwing rocks and what have you. I've had the windshield broke whether somebody threw a rock through the front windshield right here in Terre Haute. So I, I, I think people just fail to realize how critical that is because that can not only injure you, but it puts everybody in jeopardy that's on the train, if it's a passenger train or, or it, if it's, even if it's just a freight train, all the other people that are working. Yes, that's, that's right. And, uh, and two overhead bridges are pretty bad. You always got to watch people on overhead bridges that they don't seem they want to drop things on you as you go under. Now, in your career, and I hope I'm not stirring any, any bad memories, have you had the misfortune to have a collision? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have. Would you care to share any of that with us? Oh, no, no I've had some, I've had some, uh, I've had some hits. Uh, uh, they weren't all fatalities. I've had, a, you know, a couple. I hit a guy down at Gosport one time. Uh, he was drunk, and he was parked on the rail and uh, didn't even hurt him. <laughs> he, he walked away. We so, shoved his pickup about a quarter of a mile down the track and him with him in it. I guess that's one you can talk about because nothing happened, you know, but. Also here, here an example of somebody intoxicated parking, uh, parking his track on the rail and then uh, fortunate enough to talk about it, but that's not always the case. Being able to talk about it after the fact—that's that's right. No, no. When when they get hit, they lose. I mean, uh, you know, you don't do damage to these engines normally. A lot of times, you don't even scratch the paint, and uh, you do the the uh, results are terrible for them. I know, I remember, I think this was actually a promotion at one time ago that always stuck in my mind that uh, if you if you race a train to the tracks, even if it's a tie and you're in the car, you lose. Yeah, that's right. Tom, thank you very much. Any parting comments that you'd like to make? Well, I just wish the people would uh, stop at the crossings and, uh, you know, we're, we're not on them very long, you know, when we're running. 40, 50, or 30 mile an hour even, you know, we don't, we don't occupy the crossings very long and uh, whether they're on the crossing or not is not making a difference, you know. I mean, there's nothing I can do to stop. I mean, that's just all there is to it. I think that sums it up and, and just as Operation Lifesaver says, look, listen, and live. Yeah. Tom, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Right. Appreciate having you. In America, you are not required to offer food to the hungry or shelter to the homeless. There is no ordinance forcing you to visit the lonely. In fact, nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have to provide anything for anybody. Thank you for all you've given. Imagine what more could do. Hush, little baby, why do you cry? Will all our friends catch AIDS and die? Is there AIDS on the window sill? Will it kill Humpty and Jack and Jill? What if Mother Goose goes to? Or even where she gives it to you? If you don't talk with your kids about AIDS, who knows what they'll imagine? Our free booklet can help. Plant a tree for your tomorrow. In 1872, J. Sterling Morton gave the world a great idea. Plant a tree, trees for America. He created a holiday unlike any other, Arbor Day. Taste the breezes, life inside you. Make a promise to the earth. This year, the Arbor Day Foundation invites you to plant trees for America. and not 
the 60s. In a world this dangerous, there's no such thing as a harmless drug. Talk to your kids about marijuana. Hi folks, uh, my name is Rick McIntyre and I'm with the Conrail Safety Department and one of our big thrusts with Operation Lifesaver of course is to have the uh, Operation Lifesaver trains and today I'd like to take a couple minutes and talk to you about Operation Lifesaver. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with the program, it is a national program and the main thrust of Operation Lifesaver, of course, is to reduce and hopefully someday eliminate highway rail grade crossing crashes. And if you notice, I call them crashes. We don't call them accidents. Accidents are unpreventable, and a crash can be prevented. And through one of the three E's of Operation Lifesaver, and of course the three E's are education, enforcement, engineering, well, this is the education part. And we teach people about the safety of being around railroad crossings so that they can get across safely. It's very important. Last year there were over 4,500 crashes across North America and it's estimated that every 90 minutes or 14 times a day somebody is involved in a highway rail grade crossing crash. Yes, it is a big problem, but through this program and programs like these, we're educating people to do the right things and thankfully the numbers are being reduced. Very, very big reduce. Uh, reduction in numbers and it's very important to us so we, we find that our program is, is a positive program it's working well where it is active and of course this program is active throughout uh, the United States and Canada now again the education part uh, we're doing this right now with you folks teaching you the right things to do at railroad crossings and let's talk about railroad crossings we have uh, different types of, of uh, guards at the crossings we have active uh, devices, after active warning devices, we have passive warning devices. Uh, so as this train approaches the crossing, he passes the whistle board, which alerts him that that crossing is approaching. He sounds the warning for the crossing with two longs, a short, and one other long blast. And if you are at that crossing in your vehicle, and you have flashing lights and gates, those are active warning devices, or bells. And of course the law stipulates uh, one thing, and that's stop and wait for that train, of course. A passive warning device would be a crossing guard that just has railroad crossing on it. And of course that means to yield. And in yield we want you to slow down as you approach that railroad crossing so that if you would have to stop you could do that in a, in a safe manner and get stopped in time. A lot of people in, in different types of weather at night driving, they disregard the advance warning signs and actually when they get up to the crossing they see the train at night, especially at night, and it's too late and by the time they uh, hit their brakes the train or the car actually slides into the train, into the side of the train or into the path of the train and we don't want that to happen. So it's slow down and as you're approaching that crossing we want you to look in both directions. That's very important, look in both directions. And listening. And listening, you know, in our vehicle state are so soundproof uh, and we're preoccupied with a lot of different things inside that vehicle. We could be carrying on a conversation, we could be talking on a cellular telephone. Uh, we could be scolding the kids, telling them to sit down and behave. So when you come up to that crossing, you know, quiet everybody down. Turn the radios down. Get off those old cellular telephones uh, or your radios if you have to, just for a few seconds, so that you can uh, get across in a, a, a safe manner as you can. Uh, everything that distracts you could, could take away just for a fraction of a second and could cost you at that crossing. So listening is very, very important. And uh, the second part of the, the uh, three E's is enforcement. And right here on this train today is a very good example of how all law enforcement agencies from all levels, whether it's local, state, federal, are assisting with the major railroads right now. And they see the problem, especially today, they've been able to ride up in the locomotive, they've seen our monitor up here, and they see the problems that our crews have while we're traveling down the track. And they see people disregard the safety for themselves and other people in their cars and of the crews, and they take terrible chances and try to beat a train at a crossing. Why? Impatience. Driver's impatience is the largest cause of all highway rail grade crossing crashes. Uh, people today, uh, we, we just live in a very impatient society. Nobody wants to wait for anything. I mean, I see people get upset in a grocery store just waiting in line to, uh, to pay for their uh, loaf of bread or gallon of milk, whatever it is. So we need to calm people down and 
when you come up to a railroad crossing, no matter what kind of railroad crossing, we want you to obey the laws, respect the crossing, and use common sense. And that particular combination will get you across all railroad crossings safely. But again, it's up to the motorist, that individual, to take on some responsibility, shoulder some of that responsibility, obey the laws, and do the right things. That's, that's the very important thing. That's the enforcement side. And then we have the engineering side, the 30. And that deals with the grade crossings themselves. We have an existing crossing. We want to make that as safe as possible. Or possibly we have a program, and I say we, I mean Conrail. Conrail has a program where we have a gentleman that works in certain areas. He will go into a community and work with that area and that community and possibly for crossing closures. So you have multiple crossings going through your town, like maybe six or seven crossings. So he will work with the community to maybe to close off a couple of those crossings, then step up and improve the existing crossings that are there. And uh, it's been a very successful program for Conrail. Um, Mr. Chimay, who heads that up, has done a fantastic job all over the system. Then you have new crossings. So when we build a new crossing, we want to use the, the newest products out, the safest products. We want to make that crossing as safe as possible right from the beginning. And a lot of people are misinformed about crossings. They think the railroad is in control of that crossing, that you know, you need to come to the railroad to see uh, if you want to have gates or lights put at that crossing. And that doesn't happen that way. It starts right in your community with the local side of the government. And when, when, it's, uh, when you figure out what you would like for a particular crossing, like gates and lights, then you will approach the, uh, the state and the federal side of it to see what monies are available. And when they see what percentage all, f all different governments are going to pay, uh, and sometimes it's split down the middle, sometimes uh, the federal government in many cases pays the biggest percentage, but once they've uh, figured out where the monies are going to come from, then they approach the, con uh, the, 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 the railroad and they contract the railroad to install that crossing. And once it's installed, the railroad maintains that crossing for its entirety. So again, it's not up to the railroad to put something in. It's up to the governments to figure out what monies are available, and that's how that's done. And the least amount of money that's uh, put into a crossing with some lights would be $50,000 or more. So it's very expensive. But uh, a lot of people say, well, you need gates and lights at all the crossings. Well, that doesn't work that way. For instance, over 50% of all crashes occur at crossings with flashing lights and gates. They happen on beautiful days like we have right here today for this train ride. They happen within a 25-mile radius of their home. And a lot of people say, well, why don't you slow the train down? Well, the average speed of the train involved with all the crashes is anywhere between 35 and 40 miles an hour. So what is the answer? It's, again, education. We go back to that education part where we need to uh, refresh adults' memories about the laws dealing with grade crossing safety. You know, just like I said, slow down, uh, obey those laws, and use a little bit of common sense to get across safely. And the next thing uh, we want to talk about, too, is, is Conrail's good slogan that we use uh, everywhere we go. And that's, of course, when you come up to a railroad crossing, and again, I, I emphasize any railroad crossing, we want you to look, listen, and live. And hopefully you'll keep those words in your head and get across all grade crossings safely. If you don't stop someone from driving drunk, who will? Do whatever it takes. I hang out with a pretty trashy circle, the circle that helps this circle. It starts when we recycle trash at home. It's completed when we buy products made from recycled materials. Check the label for something called post-consumer recycled content. Then buy the highest percentage of it you can find. Complete the circle. Call 1-800-CALL-EDF for your free buy recycled shopping guide. 1-800-CALL-EDF. There are lots of different names for noses. Um, snout. Schnoz. Um, ski slope. Booger factory. But no matter what kind you have, or what you call it, if you use your nose to sniff household stuff to get high, you could get brain damage. Or die. 
And that's called just plain stupid. Where's Michael? National Guard duty. Ah, bet he's just sandbagging. I don't think so. Sure he is. He left us with all the big fires to put out. Over 52% of our military is made up of the National Guard and Reserve. They serve in times of war and in times of disaster. And the jobs they perform are hard enough without you making it harder. Well, let's hope he's ready for some late nights when he gets back. Please support your employees in the National Guard and Reserve. Where's, where's dinner? Well, I thought you'd be home a couple of hours ago and what, I what, put everything what, away. What, so what I is did... this? Pizza? What, I, I, a pizza? If you had just called me, I would have dinner, known what Dinner to... ready is a pizza. I didn't know you'd be so late. Let me ask you, you something. Is, is it I, I... too much to have dinner Honey, waiting when so I go home? Please don't be so loud. Don't tell me what to do. You shut up. I thought you'd be home I can get here. pizza at work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll do I something better. You. I'll, I'll fix You'll you something, something now. better. Let go of me. Get in the kitchen. No. <laughs> well, it hurts. Do you want to see what hurts? For information, call 1-800-END-ABUSE. Garfield, we're not going anywhere until you use that safety belt. Gar okay, let's go. Safety belts save kids. Buckle them up every time. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Indiana State Police Public Information Program and the information we've brought to you about Operation Lifesaver. From speaking with the engineer, to the federal safety officials, to the public spokesperson that talked about Operation Lifesaver. The whole idea is to make your driving experience a safer one, especially when it comes to the point of coming to a railroad crossing and making sure you get across safely. Remember what they say at Operation Lifesaver. Look, listen, and live. And just like when you're in a car, we ask you to buckle up because the life you save may be your own or that of somebody you love. Till next time, take care. Bye-bye. advertising.